what you're going to see oh. now and the conversation that you're going to hear, of course, is part of the exhibition that's across the way that some of you have seen and some of you have not seen, A Call to the Ancestors, which is a project funded by the um, Mellon Foundation and overseen by the Extreme Events Institute at FIU with support from the Haitian Cultural Arts Alliance, the Little Haiti Cultural oh, yeah. Complex, the Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I direct Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab. Um, the IPC Art Space, Iris Photo Collective, the City of, no, the Coral Gables Museum, Lincoln Memorial Park, the Miami Herald. I think I got them all. And whoever I forgot, I apologize ahead of time. So I want to start my introduction, because I'm going to introduce these three beautiful people here. And I want to start my introduction today by reading a passage from a Miami Herald article that was published in 2018, around the time of the Coral Gables Museum's exhibition of the same name, Caretakers a show of, that all four of our panelists, including Carl, um, were integral to. Um, and this is from the article. On April 29, 2017, Arthur Kennedy was at a monthly gathering for Brownsville locals at the Graveyard Inn, a bar restaurant across <laughs> the street from Lincoln Memorial Park. A friend told him that some of the people in attendance were planning to head to the cemetery for a volunteer cleanup. Arthur went along. When he entered the cemetery on Earth Day, no less, Kennedy could not believe his eyes. Hmm. It had been decades since he had last set foot on its grounds, and he could no longer recognize it. Like many locals from the surrounding area, Kennedy was disgusted to quote him from the newspaper. I just grabbed a machete and went in, he said. For the first time in years, Kennedy felt like he was doing the right thing. Quoting him again, we were doing something that was for hope. And soon after, the cemetery's then current owner, Jessica Williams, Jessica Williams, who's here with us today as well, and who inherited the cemetery from her late aunt, Ellen Johnson, in, in 2015, gave Kennedy her blessing to become its volunteer caretaker. He took initiative, Williams said. She said that Kennedy had a way with people. He was a leader. For Kennedy, who had set foot in the cemetery for the burial of an aunt nearly 40 years before, it was an opportunity to honor his ancestors. And having a full-time caregiver meant relief for Williams. 20 acres of untamed land and a faltering infrastructure were too much for a single person to handle. Hmm. Then a few months later, Williams received a call from the Coral Gables Museum. Mm -hmm. The museum was interested in the historical significance of the cemetery. During his first visit to the cemetery, Malcolm, Malcolm Laredo, who's sitting here as well, the museum's then director of historic research, was impressed. Kennedy's knowledge of local history was unmatched. He said, quote, I didn't really understand the scope of the historical significance of the property until I really walked through with Arthur, Laredo said. Since then, through various initiatives, including cataloging burial locations and restoring tombs and other cemetery structures, the museum then had committed to help preserve Lincoln Memorial Park's past. And we all know since then, there's a new owner and that continues. Laredo, Kennedy, and Williams were working together to find a sustainable way to revive the cemetery and to honor our ancestors. So Arthur Kennedy, sexton um, and caretaker for Lincoln Memorial Park um, from 2018. He was the sole caretaker, as I said, along with Ms. Jessica Williams, the owner. Day after day after day, he was responsible for keeping the gravestones clean and using his machete to cut back the brush. And we're gonna see images of that next door once we finish this conversation. So thank you for all your care you. um, and all you've done. I thank appreciate you. it. We also have with us owner, then owner and former owner and caretaker, Ms. Jessica Williams. In 2015, um, she inherited the property, like I said, from her aunt, Ellen Johnson. 
and she hung on to it mm -hmm. like nothing else. She made the decision that she wasn't going to let it go, and she did not, toiling each day that she refused to sell out despite all kinds of pressures, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all that you have done. Thank you. And finally, we have Mr. Malcolm Laredo, who, like I said, in 2018, he was the director of the historical research, all historical research at Coral Gables Museum. He then worked at, after that as a community historian at Vizcaya, and now he runs his own nonprofit to tell the often forgotten aspects of Miami's history and beyond. And in the interim, he also worked for uh, collecting histories and honoring the histories of indigenous communities here in Miami. I think I got that right. And everyone knows Carl. Yeah, it's Carl, the guy who's having problems. Which <laughs> 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 I've never had a problem before. Oh, 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 Something happened, something happened to this. So basically, the Coral Gables Museum at the time turned to Carl and to Iris photo collection to tell the story. So that's how it, this space, and he fits into the video. Right. Let me, so let me kind of set it up how, how we all met. So I get a phone call. I get a phone call from, from Coral Gables Museum. And they say, Carl, we need somebody to go to this Lincoln Memorial Park, and we want to document all the stuff that's inside of it. And I said, so? <laughs> and while we want somebody, code word, who's black. <laughs> right? And I said, so? <laughs> and I said, well, let me think about it, because at the time, the stories that were coming out that was very negative. Okay, exactly. Remember? Mm -hmm. yep. And we had talked. Mm -hmm. I knew of, I knew of, of Jessica, but I was not wearing, not down like that. Right, man. right, right. Because she she met me in the front with a machete. <laughs> that was her hello. <laughs> but she was cutting the weeds. That's why. She her now. So I went back to them. I said, Yeah, uh, okay. I want to do this project, but this is how we're gonna do it. I don't care about items as much as I care about stories. Each tombstone is a story. And what I want to do is to talk about the space in, as if it was a person. So I will play you, hopefully, if this thing works. The um, actual documentary, and then we're going to go straight into the conversation. Sits a forgotten place. Down a forgotten street in a forgotten neighborhood sits a forgotten place. And no, that's not entirely fair. The people who live and conduct business in Brownsville, who have loved ones interred in Lincoln Memorial Park Cemetery, would likely protest that they have forgotten nothing. Lincoln Memorial Park is an amazing case study into the African-American experience in Miami. It is very telling of the situations that blacks were put into, um, not only in life but in death. It is very revealing into the sorts of policies that were in place that would not just segregate people in life but would also segregate people in death. In the early years, black folks and white folks were not buried, in, well, even if they were buried in the same cemeteries, there was a section for the black folks used in the back of the cemetery. That's the way the city of Miami Cemetery was set up. In fact, when the city of Miami Cemetery filled up, they dug up bodies from that cemetery and took them up to Lincoln. You have Jim Crow when you're alive and Jim Crow after you're dead. Meaning, a segregated southern town where black people lived and moved largely unseen, and the racial mores of the Jim Crow era were enforced by the law, the fist, the gun. And it was built to meet a growing need to bury the black population in Miami. There was a cemetery called Evergreen Cemetery, which was founded in 1913. And at a certain point, half of the lots were sold. So there was a growing need for burial plots for African Americans. That's where Lincoln Memorial Park comes in. Lincoln is the final resting place for an estimated 10 to 30,000 African Americans, lynching victims and millionaires alike, pressed together in the equality of their legal inequality. Nearly a hundred years after its first burials, 
The graveyard is a misbegotten jumble of tombs, the names of occupants scrubbed away by years of sun and storm. Lincoln Memorial is a black cemetery in Miami, Florida, and it's where my mother and father are buried. That cemetery was founded in 1924. Uh, it was established by a man named Kelsey Farr, who was a black man, who was Miami's first black undertaker, south of St. Augustine. I'm a third generation Miamian and a, and a genealogist by avocation, and I had never even heard of Lincoln Cemetery. I'm embarrassed to admit. And we went out there one day, and I was just taken away by it. It was quite obvious why at one point it was, it was marketed as the most beautiful colored cemetery in the South. Uh, one problem that was uh, apparent in those days was that insurance companies would not sell burial policies to black people. So a lot of black folks buried their, the folks who had passed on without any plan or any financial uh, 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 effort. So for that reason, almost from the beginning, uh, that cemetery was in a financial crisis. In that sense, the tale of Lincoln Memorial is not yet a success story, not yet a story of the ragged and unkempt made to shine like new. It was amazing. I mean, it was high brush. It was like looking at an island that had never been touched before. Actually, like when you first come in, you had 10 feet tall bushes. I mean, you had an area that hadn't even been touched in over 30 years to the back of like, what I say like A, A, A4, A2, and I call those areas that stood the north side of the, um, of Lincoln Memorial, I mean, it's, it was like, it was crazy with seeing all this weeds, debris, dead animals, um, vines everywhere. I mean, it was a sight to see, man. It was really, really unbelievable, really. And when Kelsey Farr took over the cemetery, he left it to his goddaughter, Ellen Johnson. My auntie passed away and I inherited. She passed it on to me. And my mother was pregnant with me, working out here. And I was practically born and raised out here. A lot of the people that are buried there actually helped build Carl Gables. And we thank him, George Merrick, and, and give him his, his more than fair share due. He's, he was an incredible visionary, but he had to have people to carry out his work. And these were the people that did it. And, um, they need to be recognized also. One of the most tragic uh, things about Lincoln Memorial is that we have people out there who died for this country, veterans, uh, who we cannot find where they're resting in that cemetery. And that's a great disservice to the country. I've been taking care of this cemetery since 2013. It's been very hard, very, very hard. Um, it's indescribable, you know, really it is. I look at all this and the process I'm going through, and um, it's going to get better. I know it's going to get better, but it's, it's been a hard road. It's, it's been a hard road. It's going to take some time, and they're here with me, and they're not going to go anywhere. And that's the good part, you know. They're not going anywhere, and I'm not either. This is Lincoln Memorial Cemetery, final resting place to the millionaire, the lynching victim, and the Tuskegee student whose mother died. Here, a shopping cart sits abandoned in the weeds. Here, the fence sags under the weight of its years. But here, too, fresh bouquets of red and gold flowers adorn a few of the tombs and small American flags hang limply in the posts of that tired fence, their faded colors barely stirred by the breeze. You kept your promise. You kept your promise. You said they're not going anywhere. You kept your promise. And you kept your promise that you would make sure that they were not going to be forgotten. And you recorded those promises. So, you know, we don't have many victories often. We just don't. Today we won. Because of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
greetings and salutations to everybody. My name is Malcolm Laredo, and there are an infinite number of ways to begin a story. And there's an infinite number, here, and endings don't exist. So I'm sitting here, Carl reached out, he's like, do you want to participate? I said, of course, I come by. And I really didn't think about how I was going to talk about it, because Jessica and Arthur and I have known each other for many years. I knew that it would just come natural. And as I was sitting up here, I thought, like, why don't we start at, at, the, at the beginning, right? And put ourselves in this story in context to space-time. And we'll be able to, to have conversations with people who are located I keep my in, promises. in the carving of history. As we go through, we're going to see people who have carved the history prior to us. And the people who etched in stone, and it takes a lot of energy to etch something into stone. So these people did etch something into stone, and they didn't have to. And there's an innate, these days they call it a craziness. And I also call it having the music inside of them. And, and these two folks have the music inside of them, as does Carl and other people that are in So where do Jessica, where does Arthur, and where do myself come into this story about the cemetery? Right? I'm a long-winded guy. So, when Kelsey, when the cemetery was founded, it was founded in a place where people were segregated um, in death, just as, as they were in life. And it's like uh, the great Arthur Dunn said, uh, Jim Crow when you're alive, Jim Crow when you die. So, <clears throat> there have been two, um, originally in Miami's history, blacks and whites were buried in the same cemetery, and it's called Miami City Cemetery. And that was the official city of Miami municipal cemetery. Blacks had a kind of little sliver on the west side, and then whites had a big portion on the right side, right? And after then, you know, two or three cemeteries developed um, by 1924 and 1926, right? And this is a segregated place, Miami, hyper segregated. Kelsey Farr, Black Undertaker, um, founds Lincoln Memorial Park in 1924, 1925. Now, Miami experienced a ridiculous amount of growth between 24 and desegregation, right? In the 60s, but really in the 70s, right? There, there were race riots happening for desegregating people way after the, the, the laws were passed. Um, so for those 40, 50 years, right, of, of segregation, there were no new cemeteries opened for, for people of color. There were tons of new cemeteries opened for uh, people who weren't of color. You know, you had Flagler Memorial, there's a bunch of, of cemeteries, but there weren't any new cemeteries since the 20s until segregation ended um, in, in, in the 60s, in, in the 50s, in the 70s. So the point is, is that you had a huge population growth in Miami and people died. All of us die, and we all need a place to go when we die, just like we need a place to go when we live. And while we had all these new white cemeteries happening, you didn't have any new black cemeteries happening. Everyone's getting piled into the same cemetery, which results in people getting buried on top of each other, in vaults, and, and it speaks to the energy and the amount of mourning per square footage of that cemetery surpasses by far any other cemetery in Miami. So Kelsey Farr is owning this cemetery. He passes away. He, he passes it on to Ellen Johnson. Ellen Johnson takes control of the cemetery. And I think that Ellen probably had the music in there. And Ellen, I mean, it's a huge responsibility, something to inherit. You inherit the lives of, of tens of thousands of people. Okay, and we don't know how many people are buried there. All right, there's so much technology. We know everything. We know how many people are buried there. We don't know how many layers there are, you know? And it's a, it's a huge responsibility. And Ellen Johnson carried on, and from my understanding is, in, in essence, um, Ellen became older, and she was a person, a single person, right? No help from the county, no help from the city, when this is a very important cemetery, perhaps the most important cemetery in Miami. So it starts to fall into, into disrepair because it got full. It got full before any other cemetery in Miami got full. 
right? The cemeteries that were around in the 20s for Miami weren't full, that were for, for white folks. That's because there were a bunch of options, and there weren't a bunch of options for black. So what do you do with a property, a cemetery, that's out of things to, to sell, right? What does it become? It becomes a, a, a pit, a, a financial pit, and it becomes a responsibility. And Miss Ellen Johnson inherits it, and when Miss Ellen Johnson passed, she passed it on to Jessica. And that's where Jessica comes in. And Jessica actually, I suppose, comes in prior to this because Jessica had many experiences with the cemetery as a child. So let's, let's ask Jessica, my friend, what, what's your first memory of the cemetery, your first impression of a memory of the cemetery as, as you were a kid? And, and how did you feel about your auntie being this you know, like... Well, the first impression, I went to a kidding garden right behind it. I was going to a kidding garden right behind it, and my mom or my auntie would come pick me up, and I used to climb on the tombstones. I didn't really know what was going on, but all I seen was graves on top of the ground, you know. That was my, my very first experience with the graveyard. My very first, as a little girl my first experience. Did you feel like a, a sense of like, that's my auntie's cemetery right across the street? Was that like something, was that a pride you had? Or was that something you were even aware of? No, I wasn't aware of it yet until I got older, to be honest. I didn't, you know, it was just, it was just fascinating to me with the graves being on top of the ground. So, you know, but I didn't, I didn't come aware of it until I got older. When do you think maybe you became aware of it? When my auntie, my auntie came to me and she was tired. She was tired. She was tired and she said she couldn't do it no more. And would I come in? I said, of course, of course I would. So I went and I did whatever I had to do, you know. It wasn't easy, but I did it, you know. She got up, you know, she put her foot down, and she, you know, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. And she stayed there with me for a little while, but eventually she went home, you know. She went home and she rest, and she, you know, smoked her cigarettes and, and drunk her milk. <laughs> you know, that, 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 was, that was my first experience. Yeah. How old was I? Oh boy, 40, I was, I was 39, 39 years old, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess the story of you and Arthur and just the momentum of, of taking care of, of memories, it's before y'all, it's, it's Miss, it's, uh, it was Ellen, Ellen. Right. So, what was Ellen's, what was she like, the, the owner of, of Lincoln Memorial Park since Kelsey Pye? Like, what was, was she like a prickly, a prickly lady? Was she, you know, excitable? Did she like to talk about it? Was she cranky? Was she... She was something else. That's all I could put it. And that was, that was just it, you know, and, um, you know, people would come out there and they say, Miss Johnson, I want to find my auntie. They say, go out there and call her name. She, <laughs> she, you will find her. You know, and sometimes she looked in the book. Sometimes she would just point the grave out. You know, they'll tell her my, my they, they dad's name, their mother name. She just go point the grave out. You know, I don't care how many years ago it was. She knew where every grave was that she buried. And she was serious about that. She was serious. People would just pop up. She would just point, what, what year it was? She would lead them, just point, she would just point. You know, it's over there. You'll see the name over there, you know. But she knew where every grade was, every grade, yeah. She was amazing. She was an amazing lady, she was strong, she was serious, she was beautiful. But she had this, this strong, I mean, oh my God, it's amazing. She passed away and 
it's just talking about it, it's just, you know, it's just something. That lady was, she was, she was mean, she was nice, she told you what was on her mind, you know, she didn't have no problem saying, sit your ass down, you know, she was, she was like that, she was like that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did she tell you anything about her life? Anything about like, you know, like the, the, the story of her life? Or was that something she kept to herself? Yeah, yeah. She, she was, was very inside. Yeah, very, very inside. Because I had done got gotten older, so she was like, you don't need to know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you good. I can see that right here, you good. You know, so that was that, you know. And it was some things I was scared to ask, and some things I wasn't. So I had to stay in my place with her, because she wouldn't answer it. <laughs> that's, that's how she was, you know. And I respect that, you know. She didn't have any kids, so I was the baby of the family. So, you know, she took me in and told me to do this and do that, you know. She told me to do this. <laughs> yeah, but that's how she was. Thank you for sharing. So Ellen Johnson, right? So that's the second owner of the cemetery, right? So then Jessica inherits the cemetery. I'm trying to go chronologically, right? What was your first impression? When did you first find out that you own a cemetery? Did you know this was going to happen no. before? Dance, this is just a, surpr a surprise, yeah. right? Yeah, wow. it was very, very <laughs> much of a surprise. Very, very much of a surprise. Because I knew something, but I didn't know it all, you know? And so once my auntie went home, and she gave me the keys, I was there like with blindfolds on, you know? But eventually it came to me. You know, it came to me, and uh, she had paperwork, you know, her books was in order, you know, everything was in order. So it was very easy for me to, you know, get things right, but it was just that grass that was overgrown. Oh my God, it brought me in tears. I never knew a graveyard can look like that. I never knew it. It was graves that was covered and you thought it was grass. But, I mean, it was terrible, it was terrible. It was so sad. I went out there and I cried. Every day, I talked to those people. I cried and I talked to them. And it just gave me hope. The spirit out there is just unbelievable. You hear me? It's unbelievable. And they gave me hope to do what I had to do, and I did it. I did it, with tears, and with hope and grace, I did it. I did it. Let me tell you all that Jess did in fact do it. And, you know, I can't imagine the, the responsibility, right? I've got, just imagine how difficult it is to deal with your own life, right? One human being who's alive, most of us probably don't have to worry about an acre of property. Can't afford an acre of five. Most people can't. Imagine 11 acres of, of memories and, and of injustice and of pride and, and, and this energy that, that Jess is talking about is so palpable. So palpable. It's, it's incredible, especially at the moment when I first encountered it. Um, I stopped in the car, I got out. It was one o'clock in the morning. I had no business being there. I got out and I parked my car towards the cemetery. And this is where I guess I come in. We're trying to do chronology. Actually, let's go back. All right, let's go back to when Arthur came in. All right, now. Mr. Arthur Kennedy, you were out there because you had volunteered, correct? And that was your first introduction. Yes. And with these volunteer efforts, you know, it's, 
it's, it's a messaging of, of hope more than it is fixing the problem. And this is something that we'll learn as we go through this conversation in the process, going and cleaning up one time a month and putting the responsibility of these tens of thousands of lives on a community with no help from the government, no help from the county, no help from the city. So, Arthur, when, so you go there and you express in the video that, you know, like it was an island. It was a place that had never been before. People had never been to before. What brought you back? How did you, how, what brought you, brought you back to, and you know, like, uh, how did your and, and Jessica's relationship, you know, interact? I mean, what did you think about this guy who's like, hey, like, let me come in, like, just machete stuff around, you know? I'm sure y'all were, were, I know y'all were close, you know, y'all were buds um, in each other's lives in that way, but was there a moment, you think, that, that you just became fixated with, with the land and, and the people there and, and the injustice was, or did it just happen? What's your, what's, what brought you back? And what was it like when you came back alone without 15, 20 people clearing a, a certain amount? Well, when we first um, got together, me and a friend, we were sitting and talking and um, he came, he came, he went out to Lincoln Memorial to do a, a video, a music video. Hmm. And um, Jessica, they were worried about Jessica. Jessica had, you know, a heart and said she was out there. And they're like, wow, this lady came out of the pocket of the bushes on it. <laughs> she <laughs> got she, mad, Jessica yeah, got mad. What y'all doing out there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, get the egg, he said, man. He said something else. <laughs> but um, he was more like overwhelmed by how it looked. And he's a, he was the type of guy that was in the community that uh, fussed with politicians and all that type of stuff, every actor um, in the community. And when he told me about Lincoln Memorial Cemetery, I knew the cemetery because my, um, I have like seven family members out to that cemetery. And a lot of them uh, did a lot for the community and uh, raised me. And I remember being a baby that was young, like four years old, I can remember what things like they told me and told me was amazing. And um, my grandfather was one that was out there. You know, he passed away when I was 10 years old. And he taught me a lot, especially like with history of Miami that people really don't know about. And um, always talked to me, looked me dead in my eyes. And he was there for me. And, um, when he had passed away, it like it touched me the way that everything he taught me, he never taught me about death. So I was like stuck and I went to, I had a, um, a mom and a father. My father, he was a, excuse my spirit, he was a pimp. And my mother worked for the um, police department. So I seen both sides of the world. But then when you're an only child, it's kind of tough on you. Because, you know, you, you want um, a family together, but you accept what you have. Because my mom gave me the best she had. We had nice houses and all that but no furniture, we sleeping on the couch, uh, on the floor, on a, on a carpet. But the, what she wanted to show me was, you can have things, but you gotta work hard for it. My grandfather um, went, to, went to the world to me, cause my father, he was in and out of prison. And uh, excuse me, guys. And my aunt, she, um, she had, um, did a lot in what they call it, struggle over town. I had two aunts over there. Um, one was Rosa Mae Jackson. And she had um, three restaurants over town, what's called um, George's Cafe. And she helped the community out, giving people jobs. My mom, she was, um, she grew up, she worked inside the um, cafeteria um, before she worked in the police office. I mean, police um, got stopped working at the police station at Metro Dade County, uh, where she retired from. Before that, she was basically working in the um, cafe for my grandmother. And my grandmother loved her so much, you know. And um, she always told Hallie and my dad, even though he was running the street, she told Hallie and my dad. And um, my mom was a D.A. Dorsey Skills Center. And once she went to D.A. Dorsey Skills Center, she started working for Metro Dade County Police Department. And um, my father was in and out of prison. 
And my grandfather was the one like to tell me, um, right from wrong, um, you always gotta know your history and you just gotta accept your past to whatever be the future you cannot. Don't, don't beat yourself up what you don't have. Just be happy with what you have. And you know, when he, when he, when he talked to me, we ride and go see my, my father in prison. He passed on like muddy waters and stuff like that. So I got hooked on music. And um, it was just so genuine because he was like a, he was like a best friend too. And um, when you lose somebody like that, and you get 10 years old, you don't know nothing about death. You know, you ain't never seen no death, you don't know nothing about that. You know, it, it kind of like messed you up. I mean, my aunt, she was murdered in her house. And I see her um, come out of her home. And when she had got, my, got me a home in it, and um, when I was three years old, it's his house. So my mom, every time it was happening to me, I went at the house. And when I heard that story at eight years old, it, it got like made me start thinking because I see my aunt come out on the stretcher, but I still ain't thinking about that. I ain't even know that my aunt because my mom quickly just pulled off in the car. So I didn't know. But man, my grandfather died. That touched me in a way that I really didn't want to talk to him by the time I was like 11 years old. I didn't trust nothing. Because like I said, you've been the only child, you're inside a room, you're isolated. And you learn how to deal with things in a hard way that you have nobody to talk to. And so luckily, when I was growing up, I went to a um, private school called St. Francis de Xavier. And the power of prayer is serious. And I was very attentive, um, read because I was by my, you know, in the home, my mom, I wanted to impress her. And I wanted to impress my father because he would write me letters. And so I was reading at a young age. But then I said always that something that my father did probably was wrong, but I'm still gonna love him regardless. I don't care if he never bought me nothing. I'm still gonna love him because I have a father. And I have a mother that works hard. But when you go out into the world, it's a different atmosphere from being in close then. You got different personalities you gotta deal with. Some people have brothers and sisters. And I ain't say I had that because I accept whoever I met as a brother and sister. And um, it was like, racism back then, but it wasn't like bad to where it was hatred. It was love because when I was growing up, even though we was in Overtown and I lived out of town, it was mixed. You know, you had Spanish and um, like, you know, Cuban, Dominicans, Haitians, so it was mixed. So we learned how to get along with each other in the stuff we had. And that was, a, that's a, that was a great thing because I can go right outside and talk to people. I wasn't enclosed. But um, when you, um, Go into the community and you have friends and you go in the house and something going on with mom, you have no one to talk to. But luckily when I went to school, the prayer that we was there doing and being around the other kids in class, those were my brothers and sisters. So I didn't feel alone. I was eager to go to school. And um, my grandfather again, he was like, you wearing this uniform going to school, what you feel like? I said, army man. <laughs> what you mean? I'm mean, like, I wear this uniform. They ain't got no uniform down this school. We wear a uniform. And uh, I didn't even know my grandma, was, my grandfather was a soldier until he showed me that picture. And so that like inspired me to like, wow, because you're looking for brothers and sisters. So I said, well, look at this uniform on. That's something that, you know, we carry on. <clears throat> so when he passed away, it had an effect I can't even explain. Because you love, when you love someone that teaches you everything, and he had taught me direct. I mean, I wasn't like a, just a grandson to him. I was like really a, a vessel of him. You know, like I was a part of him from how he taught me. It was like, you my DNA. He used words like that. And um, he told me about D.A. Dorsey, things that you want to never really tell a child, he told me. And, um, as we went along and he passed away, I got over it. You know, I wasn't the best child I was as growing up. As I got older, my grandfather kind of like had me like um, curious about a lot of things. Because here come my father, he comes home from prison. And he was still rocky back and forth, you know, but he still had respect for me. My father never beat me a day in his life. He never cursed at me. 
we pretty much were like brothers instead of father and son. I guess it's distance apart, and by him being in prison, and me going to see him in prison, it was like a bond me and him had. And I used to always be curious, oh, I wonder how it is behind prison, because they got uniforms on too, but I don't want no uniforms. <laughs> and later in life, my father, he really showed me a change, they changed the life. Because my mom and my father couldn't be married. She worked for the police department. He was getting all type of trouble. Because he escaped from ICDC. That was a, um, a jailhouse back then before the um, They had Dade County Jailhouse and um, the county jail, ICDC. She's a clever dude. Yeah, he, um, <laughs> he was smart. And um, he escaped from that. And so they told my mom that she couldn't be with him. And um, they, they separated, but they still was friends. And that was a beautiful thing to see my mom and dad. I never seen them argue. And I go around other people's kids, their house, and um, see their mom and dad going at it. And um, it was like, you, oh, you really, like, I was nosy. Because being the only child, you don't look, you don't, you don't pay more attention than somebody else's sister and brother. They were the only brother and sister I had. I had to really be nosy. I go look at a person and really, like, watch them and, you know, say, well, wow, let me see what type of characteristics they have. You know, if they're good or bad. Because I came from both sides of the. My dad was in the ghetto, my mom, she was in the ghetto, but she showed me the best it was. So I understand people, or when they go through things, and how to tear myself from being involved in a lot of wrongdoings. But it got to the point that when you in the streets and you really love someone and you lose them, you kind of rocky. Because when you ain't got no guidance, the streets become your, your all. B.S. my mother, we live out in County Line Road, nice, nice condo apartment, no friends, we live on, we sleep on the couch. People didn't know that, so I still had that in me, like, man, it's, it's not all peaches and gravy, how people think it is. You go to private school, you spoil, you don't need child, your mama driving a Cadillac, they really had no idea. Hmm. So I couldn't speak out of that, but I wish I had a brother or sister, like I say, you know that I ain't had none of that. But luckily, like I said, that uniform and kids, I can talk to them about my personal thing in life because they understood when they was in private school. I left private school and went to public school. Like here it is, like from my mom's side to my daddy's side. That was tough. Kids cursing. I mean, it was so like overwhelming to me to be from private school to go to public school. It was a big change. And then being only child. But it was a traumatic change that I stood out because I knew a lot of things that they didn't know as far as books. And they looked up to me like that and came up, I them kids were smart, and I thought they were, they were real smart, they were reading right. And very crafted about things, you know, culinary, auto mechanic, because they, they did that in the school, we went to school, they had that inside schools before they had them inside institutes, so you had to go learn outside of the graduate. So, I got dealing in the street, and was doing things I wasn't supposed to do, got punished for it, I went to prison. When I went to prison, I didn't want to be there. But I was, again, in that uniform, so I adapted to the people that was inside that with me and learned how to deal with that, but that's one of the places I wanted to be. My grandfather was always on my mind, and I said, man, he's just riding for some important reason. I'm, I'm in prison, I'm keeping my grandfather. And it was that ride we took to go see my father as a child. So I'm afraid, like, uh, he told me, like, you know, everybody makes mistakes, nobody perfect. So you know when you make that mistake, you gotta change from what you did to be right, or if you're gonna stay that person, you stay that person and accept your pain. You gotta accept your you know, those consequences of things you did. So I accepted that um, when I went to prison. It was a situation that I had did, wasn't bad. I did it. When I, um, I went to prison, it was quite natural what I did and anybody else who did, but I won't speak on that because, you know, we stand into a character about something. And, um, being from the streets, I was pretty much, people look at you a leader. Because when I went to prison, only child spoiled, uh, I went to prison. My nickname was June, but it's a June in prison. I was a juvenile in an adult prison. And that's like, you know, you see things that you would never think in, the, in this real, I mean, seriously. But by being the only child, being locked in that room, I could deal with it. Like a lot of other people couldn't deal with it. And, um, but it hurt because you can't, you ain't out your freedom. But them, them rides that my grandfather had again, it haunted me to do better. 
some type of way. So whatever it was in the street off, I'm gonna do better, I'm gonna be the best it was in the street. Whatever I'm doing, I'm gonna be the best at it. Maybe it's wrong, but I'm gonna be the best at it. And believe it or not, whatever I did wrong, right or wrong, I always prayed before I did it. I didn't feel bad about it. That was something that placed something in you consciously. So when I had um, changed my life from that, I said, man, I wanna do better. I started doing construction and got good at it and um, start learning the business aspect of construction because my father and my grandfather had me read. And um, me and some friends, you know, we were sitting inside a van one night, we had a change for doing wrong, and we were just talking. You know, I got to get around and talk. We weren't talking about sports. I don't even watch TV at all. I don't watch sports. I couldn't tell you nothing about no sports, but I was good at all of it. And um, a friend of mine, he knew it all. And he's supposed to be politicians about politics and all like that, but I knew about it. And um, we commented, he said, man, I'm finna go out to the cemetery. We did a video, and um, Jessica jumped out on bushes, man. He said, man, look at he, he said, he ain't never seen her. I said, he's scared, man. She came out of the bushes. I said, did you tell bushes. that story, like what was going on, like where you were in the cemetery, and like how Jessica? Oh, man. <laughs> Jessica something, tell my Ellen Johnson. I was screamed at the first time I went to the cemetery. <laughs> Yo, Jessica, when we first went out to that cemetery, we many guy got together, they did a video, so he said, man, we finna go out there and he was community active and he gonna talk about everybody. Oh, Rick Ross and um, the president should come out. This, this, this is ludicrous. This, look at this man. And then he uses big words and he's a really thug, a hardcore thug, but I'm talking about, <laughs> he's crazy too. And, but Jessica, I don't know what y'all intentions is, but we got to do that. You can talk about all them people, but this grass got to get over and cut. I was so anxious because I knew my grandfather was buried out there. It was my passion. I want to see his, I want to see his headstone. So I had a personal thing I wanted to do, but I kept it close to my, to my heart. It's like my grandfather, my aunt was out there. Both ass was buried out there. And I was like, I want to see the headstones. And as a child, I went out to Lincoln Memorial Cemetery. My mother to see my, my um, aunt's grave. And I remember a tree that was there. But by then, it was a tree, we just pushed as tall as this, tall as this, this wall. And um, Jessica did not play the radio. I mean, when you go inside that chapel, you're not going with on record set. You're gonna get your tool and go to work. But by me doing construction, and being, like I said, in prison, stuff like that, you learn how to work hard and stay consistent in it. You know, and um, some people that come out there to that cemetery had different motives and wrong intentions. But by me wanting to see my grandfather, I didn't care about it. I, I knew the streets, and I knew a lot of people in the streets. I knew what they was out there doing. Some people just want to make videos and blog and say they was giving, just to make themselves look good. You know, and um, me, I just want to see my family. I want to see my grandfather. Headstone. So um, being at that, that cemetery, same way as Ella Johnson did and Jessica did, I memorized the books. Jessica finally gave me a chance. I turned out, I said, Arthur, you okay? You all right? You're not like them. But it took a while for Jessica. When did it take, how long did it, what was your first impression of Arthur? Do you, what was your, what happened? Where, where was it like, you know, like having a good time? My first impression was, what can y'all do out here? That was my impression. So they were filming a video, you're like, Yeah, I was, I was like, no, 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 there's no video going on here. <laughs> come on, be for real. You come out here to do a video? All this grass out here? Well, I mean, what kind of video you gonna do? <laughs> I didn't get it. You know, okay then, all right then, what, what you want us to do? I said, I want y'all to clean up this graveyard. And they, that's when they, they got together and they, you know, did what they got, had to do. And I had volunteers out there every day, every day. And I finally, the county did help me with a dumpster. So I had a dumpster and I was moving it here and there because when they got in this section, the dumpster was like somewhat in the way. So I had to move it over there. They was like, Jessica, we can't keep moving this dumpster. So I finally got it in one spot that I wanted to. But people had to lock, walk a little further to the dumpster, but it was okay, you know. It was okay, I needed that dumpster, you know, it was okay. But Arthur came out there with those guys, and they got to work, you know. 
And Arthur was most the hardest worker, you know. So I kind of leaned on to him, <laughs> you know. And when they didn't show up, he showed up, you know. And that's how I was with Arthur. That's how I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Look, we can't go too long because we got to take the tour. Okay. Oh, my right. I know, I know, I know. Okay. I know. Look, All right. Look, I promise. What should I ask? What should I ask? If you want the short version, what should I ask? Well, you want me to wrap it up? Yeah, well, this is my way. No, 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 you all haven't seen the show. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I want to see the show. You oh, haven't seen the show. Have a question. Yes. Uh, this just occurred to me as, as you were talking, and I, I uh, had never given this thought, and so I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this. Um, we live next. Lee and I live next door to a cemetery on. Cape Cod that went back to the 1600s and, and we had pilgrims buried there and all that kind of stuff. It was, all, uh, it was a church cemetery. And so it's always been on my mind and I actually even bought some vacant land at one point and thought I'd have the first Jewish cemetery on Cape Cod wow. so I could be buried there. Right. And so I started talking to people about it. But eventually as time went on I started thinking about being cremated instead of being buried because my son's in Vancouver and he's not going to come visit my grave and he's going to be right. to do that. Kind of stuff. And my parents are buried in Louisville, Kentucky, and I haven't been there in years. And so the notion of cremation, when you have this situation in Miami where the graves are being put right on top of each other, mm -hmm. was there any conversation amongst people in, in the black community that, that I'd rather be cremated than be piled on top of people and have the weeds grow. Well, I, funny you say that. Well, everything's been taken away from us, the people of color. Everything, from our dignity, to our kids, yeah. to our parents, erasure. Cremation for black folks is erasure. We can't afford that. I mean, I want, I'm going to get cremated. Um, and for, for, for other reasons. We'll do it together. Yeah, for other reasons. <laughs> but, you know, this is what made, this is why Lincoln Memorial is so important. When I was working there, I, I, I can't. You know, I'm telling you. If you don't, if you haven't been there, you don't understand. There is a peace. There is a sense of dignity that you don't get anywhere in Miami. Nowhere. This is where Pitt says. This is where the lynch. Those who are lynch. Those who are rich. And those who lived are buried. They depend on us because they talk to us. You may think I'm joking. Hmm. <laughs> they will talk to you too. It is not a place for the dead. It's where people who live go to rest. By force or by choice. This is where they go to rest. So, to answer your cremation, it's not something, because we need a place to rest. We need a place to have peace. That was the most important thing about that 22 acres. You could be there and the planes flying over, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. noise, it's not even noise. That's right. It's like birds yeah. chirping. Yeah. You heard it in the video, I'm not lying. Mm -hmm. It's recorded. My heart goes to all three of you, but, but definitely to, to Jessica and to Arthur, King Arthur. Mm. Because no one was watching and he didn't give a damn. 
And you know what it is to cut something down. Every time, every time you plant a seed, they say kill it before it grows. That sense, that attitude, I'm gonna keep planting, I'm gonna keep cutting, mm. I'm, I don't care how fast that thing grows, I'm gonna keep doing it day after day under a hot sun, I mean 90 degrees, 95 degrees, 110 degrees. Mm. He's still out there in full gear, sweating. Sometimes we don't even have enough water. We have to go. He goes and get a a a, 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 a cooler, mm -hmm. and that he's working there. By the time he's finished work, that water's now warm. Mm -hmm. it still works. And why do you do it? From my ancestors and history. You heard it from him. You heard it from him. Remember what he just said. This is why I had this. I wanted you to hear from them. Because this is more than just history. This is more than something in the past. That space called Lincoln Memorial Park is as contemporary as any museum that you walk into. I put it against Pam. I put it against Frost. I put it against Bass, against Mocha, because that space is living history, not dead history. And shame on us, shame on me, shame on you, to let that place be in the situation it is now. Shame on all of us. We could do better. We better do better. Because the past will haunt us. We don't learn from it, we're doomed to repeat it. But not on my watch. Sorry, folks. Not on my watch. So we got work to do. We got weeds to kill, hmm. racism, xenophobia, you know, hatred for trans, you know, transgender people, hatred for people because they have, they spew a different pop. Look what's happening in Israel right now. We got work to do, folks. And I'm going to show you what happens when we do decide to. When we go next door, when we listen to our ancestors and decide to listen, we got work. You have any closing statements, sir? Okay, you take the phone. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's your wife, sir. <laughs> I know her. But she's out. So I know. Okay. Woo. Uh, I'm sure I'm the oldest person in the world. Should have looked at the other side. The fattest one in the room, too. Mm -hmm. So I grew up here from third grade through high school. My children grew up here from kindergarten through high school. My grandchildren have gone to school here. This, in my opinion, Miami area has very little sense of history. And that's the problem. It's not taught in the schools, okay? And people have no idea as to what the history of the community that they're living in is. And that's how things fall. I mean, I, I could agree with you, but unfortunately, um, Florida yeah. State education. You know, unless they go to a museum like Carl, Carl Gables. I don't work there anymore. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm a free agent, all right? They have to go to a museum mm -hmm. to see what was. It's not taught. Well, you know, my reaction to this and to history and to community is that history solidifies a sense of identity. History is propaganda, and it's what propaganda do we want to be consuming. History instills identity, and in school, American history, American history, American history, because you're an American, you're an American, you're an American. This is this imagined community that you belong to, and local history is perhaps the most empowering in many ways because it connects you with the land and it connects you with 
the trees, and it connects you most importantly to your neighbors. And, it, and when you learn Miami's history, you learn that we as Miamians have an identity, that we're siblings in, in knowing what it is to have the sun beat down on us like this. So no, we're siblings in knowing what it is to live in a place, like to love in a place like this. And local history is not as embraced as it should be. And you know, maybe it's because when people learn their local history, the community feels ownership over the community. And we don't want that, do we? We don't want the community feeling like they have ownership over their land, right? In terms of the power that be. So I think that by learning all of Miami's history and understanding, you know, that by exploring the history of the land we're on, the people have lived on for thousands, over 10,000 years, people have lived here. People have been buried here for over 10,000 years. Right downtown, where that, that wall, where that, uh, circle? not the circle, where the Whole Foods is, yeah. was a huge cemetery, huge. In 1896, when the city was founded and they were gonna build a big hotel to meet the railroad, because that was the only reason to come down here yeah. as, as a northerner was to go to this nice hotel, they tore down a huge burial mound. So it's in Miami, the city of Miami's DNA, DNA to erase the past, to accommodate the tourists. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it erases our identity as Miamians. If you go to Google right now, or Microsoft Word, you type in Miami, in, squiggly red line underneath it because that's not an identity. Mm -hmm. And I think local history helps refine our identity, our, our, our kinship to one another that can't be found in a lot of places. So I, I agree with you that there isn't a lot of local history and there's lots of issues as to why we don't explore it because Miami is so trans, transient and that's what makes Miami beautiful. Most of the people who live here were born somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to inherit this history, but it's something that can be done and it's something that's essential because the more people understand about history, history is stories. And history at its best is all of us listen to each other's stories. Mm -hmm. So I think local history is crucial. I think Carl has the music in him. I, think, I know Jessica has the music and I know Arthur has the music because no sane person in this hyper-capitalistic society is going to spend all their free time in a cemetery with people who aren't going to be able to say, hey, thank you, and take a picture of you and post it on social media. It's a thankless job. So that's my spiel on that, my friend. Thank you. Okay. You gotta make it quick. Quick, quick. quick. Go I'm gonna say it real fast. <laughs> the, the pictures that you see, I didn't even know Carl was taking them pictures. So when I seen them pictures, it touched my heart to see, because I knew I was what I was going through, but to see that, it brought me to an outdoor museum. I didn't ever tell Jessica Malcolm or Carl about 1896, the history I do know. The cemetery right down the street called Limit Cemetery. Mm -hmm. Testified to take the bodies from my body there and take them to Lincoln Memorial. I knew all that as a child. And I didn't ever say nothing about 1896 of how African Americans made the name city of Miami. Um. Nobody know who D.A. Dorsey was, but when they go out to the outdoor museum, people that go to Booker T, Phyllis Wigley, Kelsey Farr, they are privileged to know when they people birth they are. And they go to that school, they were not taught the history. So to come out in that, they get to learn that history. It's like when I went to see Malcolm, you'd be amazed when you see all this stuff. But to go out there, you really see something that was living there, it talks to you. Well, we're gonna walk next door because I want to see the face. Whoa, 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 sorry, Carl. Can we please give a round of applause oh, yeah. to these beautiful people? I want to leave them there. Right right right. I know, but still, later, later. We've known each other for many moons. We've been through so many failures. Oh yeah. And, and at the end, I think that Arthur and I, it was, it felt like failure. But years later when we saw that somebody picked up that momentum, every little thing that you do that's nice, it, it matters. It One person, it matters. Even if you feel like, what, what, what did I change? It matters, folks. Yep, it does. All right. All right. Thank Where's you. Where's the wine? <laughs> I get more wine. Okay.